your singing. Thank you, Ellie, for leading. Anyone have anything on their heart they're wanting to share this evening before we get into our scripture lesson? Psalm 73 is where we'll be. We read this last week, but it seemed like the Lord would have us go back to it and dig a little deeper, maybe. Psalm 73. A Psalm of Asaph. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. 
Therefore pride compassed them about as a chain. Violence covered them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou casteth them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors, as a dream when one awaketh. So, Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire, desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all thy works." In this passage, we see three individuals. When I read it a while ago, it dawned on me that verse 2, it almost sounds like he's diabetic. His feet were almost gone, but I guess he's not. He's talking about backsliding. But we see three individuals in this passage of Scripture. We notice God, we notice a righteous man, and we notice a wicked man. And each one in this passage seemingly has it backwards or wrong. God, who should be good, is unjust and seemingly asleep. Righteous man, who should be blessed, blessed, is troubled, distressed, and chastened. The wicked man, who should be cursed, is prosperous, strong, proud, and without trouble. It seems like, on, on first blush, that everybody's backwards. Everything is just out of, out of context and, and, and just backwards, wrong, upside down. But as we continue reading, we find that each wrong will soon correct. God, he will judge. He has been awake and keeping score. The righteous man, he's guided by God and he'll be received to glory. And the wicked man, he'll be put from God, desolation, and ultimately perish and be destroyed. So knowing all that, that even though things look upside down and things look backwards and things look bad, Knowing that, there are at times visible, obvious, illogical circumstances of good concerning wicked men. As we look around, we see wicked men prosper. And at times, we see horrible things happen to good people, righteous people. Things I don't understand. Because we see good happen to wicked and bad happen to good we see it it's real it do, it is that it does happen there is a real possibility of backsliding there is a real possibility that good people can be tripped up because of what they see and backslide so what can we do to be stable solid christians what actions will help us stay steady and hold the fort, as it were? It's the same things that Asaph did. Number one, verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God, he went. He went. He put himself in the presence of God. The songwriter said, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. There is good that comes from being in God's presence. In 2006, we decided we were going to go to Idaho on a, on a big hunt. The cabinet shop, Dad, Dad said, we'll let the shop pay for the hunt. It was going to be Mark Braden and Dad and I. 
We're going to go to Idaho. Now, Mark had hardly been out of Taney County. He'd been down into Harrison, and I think he had been to Tulsa. Never been to Kansas. So that's, that's Mark's world is Harrison, Arkansas, Taney County, Springfield, one trip or two over into Tulsa. That's his world, and he's 06, 63. He was 43 years old at the time. So we're going to go to Idaho on this big hunt. You could buy one tag. The tag was good for a mule deer, a white-tailed deer, a black bear, or a mountain lion. You could only kill one animal, but either of any of those four species. So all that summer, we're planning on this trip out west. Working at the cabinet shop, it's hot, it's dusty, it's noisy. Trials and tribulations. And when things would get tough, we would discuss and talk about being in Idaho. We would talk, what's it going to be like to walk those mountains and have that cool, refreshing air? I didn't realize it'd be such cold air, but we thought it'd be cool and refreshing. And we didn't, we would, we would watch videos on, I don't guess we had YouTube, but we would try to learn all we could about, about the northern Idaho mountains and about hunting in that area and what it was like. We read magazines and we looked at maps. Why? As things were tough, we were trying to draw, trying to get into the presence of Idaho. Now that's a real loose parallel of how it is as Christians. In our tough world, we try to get into God's presence. We do it through being around his people. Last Monday morning, I talked to Danny Williams on the phone, as we often visit, and we per near had church. He was telling me where he had preached Sunday from Habakkuk, and he had used a lot of the past, a lot of the of the book. But then when you get down to the back end of that book, that although the fig tree shall not blossom and, and all the problems Habakkuk said could happen, yet he said, I will praise God, I'll bless him. Well, Danny and I, we were in the presence of God, even though I was at Casey's getting fuel and driving, and I don't know what he was doing. But being in God's presence with his people, the music, gospel music, you were talking about the Gaithers and, and those, being in God's presence keeps us stable yes. keeps us stable the second thing we notice is he acknowledged is that a problem D? Uh, that was um, Erlina before the office I've got to go over pretty soon and take care of the kids more. well that's exciting have a, they're going to have a new grandbaby so yes. the second thing Asaph did, besides being in God's presence, he acknowledged, he acknowledged, verses 21 and 22, thus my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant, I was as a beast before thee. In the presence of God, Asaph acknowledged his sin, his foolishness, and he said, I've got a willingness to do and be right. Confession is good for the soul. It'll keep us humble and it'll keep us holy. To say there's no areas of weakness or no need for growth is a lie. If we say we've arrived, we're lying. We haven't. And it's going to lead to our ruin. All of us it's have or will soon at some times have to go to God or man and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Asaph acknowledged. You know, there's not going to be any stability without acknowledging transgressions and mistakes. Honesty is going to be key to being stable. Thirdly, down in verse 28, but it is good for me to draw near to God. You know, to go to church or be in God's presence is one thing, and it's necessary. But then he drew nigh to God. He lingered. He listened. He loved. There became an intimacy, a bond with the Lord. You know, this action also comes with the promise. James 4, 8 says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. I would illustrate it this way, probably to Ellie's chagrin. But in the spring of 06, Heidi, I mean, Kimberly had been telling me about this girl named Heidi. And she said, I think you ought to meet her. Said, she's, she's, she's got a lot of the characteristics in a woman I think you'd like. And so I, 
I had an excuse to go to Ohio. Kevin, we needed to buy that house, and I was out there. And, and Heidi was playing the piano for the singing group Kimberly was directing, and they were going over to Rising Sun, Indiana for a concert. Would you have a, a recital or for some reason, Heidi didn't go with the main group. She had to go later, and I had to go later. So Kimberly said, well, my brother can give you a ride. And so we, I went and picked her up, and, and it was about an hour and a half or two-hour drive over to Rising Sun, and, and I was a-blowing and a-going, and we were visiting and carrying on. And I was in her presence, but I hadn't drawn nigh to her. I didn't, and over that weekend, we visited, and... You talk about forgiveness earlier, Jack, and bringing stuff back up. I got home and Dad said, well, what about Heidi? And I said, well, if you're talking women in terms of tractors, I think she's a Belarus and not a John Deere. And you know she never has forgiven me for that. And I hear about it on a regular basis. But she'll say, so I'm a Belarus. Anyway, we digress. I had not drawn into her presence or drawn nigh to her. I was in her presence, but I w there wasn't that bond, that intimacy. That really didn't occur until we started dating and fell in love and, and drew close. And it's the same way with God. Yes, we need to get into his presence. That's first. Second thing is, yes, we've got to acknowledge our transgressions. And then we have to draw an eye. If we stop at point one or point two, there's no closeness, there's no bond, there's no intimacy, and there will be no stability. We'll be up and down spiritually, in and out. Good. Draw nigh to God. An intimate relationship with Christ makes one stable. Last Saturday, a week ago, Betty Magger died from, I told you all about her, she was 90 years old. She died about 4.30 in the morning, Saturday, the 7th. Dad told at her funeral, Wednesday this week, I knew Betty would get up about 4.30 every morning anyway. They went to bed about 7 at night. So in the summertime, they went to bed in the dark. They'd come to church, and we had church. They'd come at 6. Well, by the time church had got over, it was their bedtime or late. And... Could, could never grasp why you'd go to bed at 7 and why you'd get up at 4.30, but they did. But Betty would get up and start praying. She was a mighty prayer warrior, and she had told Dad, I had not heard it, but she had told Dad that I get up at 4.30 and I don't quit praying until I prayed through for the day or for any situation. She would not stop until she had gotten clear through every day that takes work and dedication to pray through daily till she knew she was clear and everything was good that's drawing naughty nigh to god so every day at 4 30 she would come into god's presence draw nigh to god so is it any wonder that at 4 30 when she should be getting up and should be hitting her knees God said, just come on over and took her home at the same time she would have been hitting her knees, drawing into God's presence. Good for me to draw near to God. I think it was Harmon Schmelzenbach was telling, or I heard his grandson telling, he had ridden, he had gotten home. It was about midnight, and he had finally laid down, and he was praying for his native missionary. Schmelzenbach was the Nazarene missionary in Africa. And he prayed for this preacher and, and he got him before the throne and, and the Lord gave him peace that all was well and he said he'd put him back in, in his church and he'd go to the next little outpost and he'd take that preacher and, and he'd, he'd pray him through that all was well and he got to the one named Samuel and he prayed for him and he tried to put him back and he, he couldn't get him, he couldn't he couldn't put him in his place. He couldn't get prayed through. And he said he told his wife, something's the matter with Samuel. I've got to go. It's an amazing story, an amazing message. At some point, it would be well to listen to it. It's about that man. It's called Ring the Bell. 
where Samuel, and we'll digress if we try to tell it, but Samuel is at a point of the, the chief has said, I'm going to kill you and your family if you ring that bell and call the crowd to worship. And Samuel and his wife prayed all night. They had prayed for a week, but all night, Saturday night. And so they're in their little outpost praying. And Harmon was back in his bed trying to pray. And he could not pray through on the situation. And he said about daylight, as the sun was coming up, the Holy Spirit bore witness to Samuel. He said, you ring that bell. He didn't tell him he would save his life. He didn't tell him what would happen. He just said, you ring the bell. And we're digressing. But Samuel said, I made up my mind. If that's what God wants, I'm going to ring that bell. Well, no matter what happens. When Harmon rode over the hill, he got there just as that man got ready to hit that bell. His presence startled the Africans. He, he instantly realized what was going on and preached a message. And the whole time, he said Samuel was down there, not just ringing the bell, but ringing it with the vengeance, said he was almost jumping off the ground every time he struck it. He had come right up into God's presence, drew near to God, and it was good for him. And the rest of his life, Samuel, he never stopped ringing the bell and proclaiming truth. It's a great message if you ever get a chance to hear it. It's on that Voices of the Past, IHC. It's on the website. You can find it back down through there by Harmon Schmelzenbach. Verse 28, the second part, I have put my trust in the Lord God. Not only did he go... He acknowledged, he drew, he put, he put. The Bible says Asher will not save us, horses will not save us, Sidney Powell will not save us. He put, it was a choice, his trust, all of it, in God. He, the psalmist was no longer going to believe what he saw. When he saw the wicked prosper, he wasn't going to hold any longer to self-righteous opinions that he has cleansed his heart in vain. He was no longer going to think defeating thoughts. The Bible says that uh, there in verse 15, if I, uh, or verse 16, thought to know this too painful. By choice and against all obvious reasonings, he would trust in God. He had put his trust in God. It's going to lead to a stable life for a Christian if we put our trust in God. My friend Jim, after Christy died, he told me, he said he knew back in January that this probably would be the year. He said, I just, God had shown me that unless he intervened, this year would be the year his wife would die. 20 years of marriage, she was 40. He said, I knew that if God didn't heal her physically, he would heal her by way of the grave. And when she got to heaven, it would be okay. And he said, I thought I would have peace with that. He said, as the time drew nigh and she was in the hospital and crashing there in July, he said, he asked the Lord, Lord, show me when she's going to die, if today's the day, so that I can call in the family. He said, I got up to have my devotions. He said, very clearly, at least two times, God showed him, this is the day Christy's going to die. He called in the family. They ultimately didn't pull the plug until the next day. But Jim said, I knew in my head that Christy was better off. And he said, I thought I could accept it. But he said, he struggled. He struggled. He told me, I need accepting grace. I was we went bird hunting last week. And, and he told me, he sa I said, how are you doing? And he said, I have perfect peace. He said, I was driving and he told me where he was. And he said, I just gave the Lord's words back to him. He said, Lord, you said you came to heal the brokenhearted and bind up. And he said, I just prayed Jesus' words back to him and put his trust in God. And he said, instantly, I had peace and victory that quick. That's the God we serve when we put our trust in him to give us instant victory. It'll keep you steady. I don't think Jim's going to be very shaky anymore on that subject. He trusts in God. And lastly, verse 28 again, the last word, that I may declare all thy works. He declared. He declared. He went. He acknowledged. He drew. He put. He declared. You know what he said? 
Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. When there is stability, there will be testimony. We'll have a story to tell. Asaph did. He declared all thy works. It's what the Bible says. I may declare all thy works. The good, the bad, the mercy, the judgments, the trials, the victories, all of it. You know, a Christian only telling one part of the story is not stable. They can't be. To focus all on judgment will miss mercy. To focus all on grace will miss the trials like what Job had. To focus all on love will miss the fact that the Bible says, come ye out from among them and be separate. We've got to declare all of the works of God if we're going to have any stability and be a solid Christian. The psalmist had his struggles, and we do too. But he became stable, as can we. We can go into the sanctuary of God's presence. We can acknowledge our sins. We can draw and be near and intimate with Jesus. We can put our trust and faith in the changeless God, and we can declare, tell the whole world that God is good. And by doing so, we'll be stable and useful and fruitful Christians. And that's what I want to be as a stable, solid Christian. Let's stand.